is God improbable? An improbable God? And, I mean, you saw the next slide. Um, oh, come on, there you go. Um, so, you, you might remember this. Um, I was quite young when this happened, but I've heard about it many times. Richard Dawkins and his campaign with the atheists, um, no, the humanists, sorry. There's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. And it's really that word probably that kind of is where, where it falls over. Um, and hopefully I'm going to show that not only is that, well, I'm going to exploit that prob probably that, oh, there's probably a God actually. Um, so God, hopefully we'll see, isn't improbable. I mean, this is relevant because um, well, in England and Wales, we've got, we had that 2021 census where fewer than half the people identified as Christian. Well, I mean, we, we know that um, church going population has been down for decades, like well before I was born, um, the church going population was well under 50%. Um, and now finally, fewer people, fewer and fewer people are identifying as Christian. Um, a high proportion are Muslim, a high proportion are in the no religious category. Um, but that's all because, well, the, the no religious category is because there's probably no God. I might as well go and enjoy my life. And hopefully we'll see that, no, there's probably a God. And you can now stop worrying and go and enjoy your life anyway. And that's the amazing thing about Christianity. Um, Okay, so tonight we're going to do, we're going to have a Worcester Top Tour through a bit of philosophy, some physics, some theology. Don't get put off by that. I'm going to try to make it as, um, I guess, as understandable to everyone because I know my brain can be a bit, a bit all over the place sometimes. Um, so don't worry if any of the finer details pass over you, but it should be all right. Um, our argument's going to be an inductive argument rather than a deductive argument. So a deductive argument is, um, I don't know. Um, so all all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. So that's that's a, a, du a deductive argument in the form of a syllogism, if you want to be fancy. Um, an inductive argument, however, is um, on Wednesdays um, the bus normally comes at quarter past nine in the morning. Today is a Wednesday, so the bus will probably come at quarter past nine. It's not, you can't say it with certainty, but it's, I guess, about likelihood. And so that's what our argument's going to be about. Um, but the main takeaway from all this is that there's a God who has a purpose with the world, um, with the life he created. Um, I'm just, just going to have a disclaimer here. Um, I'm, I'm an old Earth creationist rather than a young Earth creationist. If you disagree with me, that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to break bread with you still. Um, but... Whatever your view, hopefully we can all benefit from this. Um, yeah, whatever your take is. Okay, so five facts I'm going to talk about. So, well, the idea is that we're going to have five facts that are weird. That they'd be weird if God didn't exist, but they're expected if God did exist. So even though you could believe in no God and accept these facts, it's still it's quite improbable if you take that view. Whereas um, if you, well, if you accept these five facts, it's a lot more probable if God exists. So they are that things change and they point to a beginning. Um, we are at a perfect time to view the universe and the constants of the universe, they're fine tuned for life. And we can rely on our brains. That's something we don't think about a lot. Why can we actually trust what our brains think? Um, and then finally, the miracle of the Jews. So what better place to start than the first fact, the universe has a beginning. So we're going to look at some physical evidence for this, um, something called the Kalam cosmological argument, which is maybe the most famous argument in modern apologetics today. And then we're going to have a look at what the Bible says about this. So physical evidence for a beginning of a universe. So in 1929, this um, astronomer called Edwin Hubble, he discovered what's now known as Hubble's law. And this is where the balloon comes in. Um, thank you everyone who helped find the balloon. Um, so the idea is that galaxies move away from us and the further away they are from us, they move away faster. So imagine you've got a, a balloon like this balloon here. Um, and on the balloon, there are different points of the balloon in different galaxies. And at the moment, all the galaxies are quite close together, but that's not working. Let's try the other one. So 
So now all the points are further away from each other. They're still points in the balloon, but they're just further apart. And the more I blow, the further apart they go. Um, and a, uh, I'll, I'll use this balloon. Um, so a point that's close, well, these, this point here, let's say, and this point here on the other side, they're, they're not that far away from each other, let's say two centimetres. But here they're, I don't know, about 15 centimetres, half a foot away from each other. That's probably not half a foot, but you get the point. So the, if you start slightly further apart, you're going to end up really far apart. And so that's what the expansion of the universe is like. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> so, so if we can see that the universe is expanding, when we go forward in time, well, what's the opposite of expansion when we go back in time? There's a contraction. And um, our best theories tell us that everything starts as a singularity, a single point when time equals zero. Um, so there is a beginning to everything. And there are, this, this theory makes lots of predictions. And one of these is what's called the cosmic microwave background. I won't go into the details of it now, but uh, this is, uh, it's this slide actually, that in the background, the cosmic microwave background. If you're interested, I can tell you lots more about it, um, but we don't need to go into that now. But this is a, a very solid prediction from this, um, from this theory, and it's something that everyone who knows anything about cosmology will accept as maybe the greatest bit of observational evidence for the universe having a beginning. So this science, well, the science that we have, it points to a beginning of the universe. Um, now you've got this philosophical argument called the Kalam cosmological argument, and this is a this is a deductive argument. Um, it's got three points. The first one: everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Well, we've already seen the universe began to exist from the physical evidence. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Um, so very simple argument, very powerful. Um, there's very little to attack because the points are so well supported by evidence. And then if we have this cause, well, the cause are they must be by definition outside of the universe because if they created the universe, they can't be part of the universe itself. Um, so if you baked a cake, you can't be part of the cake to bake the cake. You have to be someone outside of the cake. Um, they must be uncaused because if they were caused, then there'd just be something else that caused that. So then you can redefine the universe to be the universe plus the thing that created the universe began to exist. Um, so this sounds like God. God is an uncaused causer who created the universe, who's outside of the universe. Um, so just from thinking about, oh, there's things change and point to a beginning, we've got, oh, God probably exists. Um, the Bible, it's very simple. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So right there at the start of the Bible, we have, we have this. Um, and isn't that amazing that a book that was written, well, about 3,000 years ago, I want to say, um, this chapter, um, Three and a half, maybe. Um, it it already said that there was a beginning, whereas it took modern science well another three 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 and a half thousand years to to realise this. Um, I, I think that's amazing, and th that makes a lot of sense if you think that a god exists, and it doesn't make a lot of sense if you don't think a god exists, because um, the much more appealing, I guess, idea for an atheist would be that the universe has just always existed like it is, but we know that that's not true. Okay, the second fact, we're at the perfect time to view the universe. So um, that's the Gainsworth Space Telescope. Um, you might have seen that in the news. It's like it's changing observational astronomy. Um, so we're going to look at Psalm 8. We're going to start with the Bible this time. And then there's going to be a bit more science and then a pretty picture that should also blow your mind at the same time. So Psalm 8. Um, well, I left my Bible. Can I use the big Bible? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, so I think this is just verses three, five, and six, but I'll, I'll read it all. Um, okay. So Psalm 8, um, this is one of my favorite Psalms, actually. Um, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. 
Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou might, mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honour. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. Our, o Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So I've picked out a couple of verses. So um, verse 1 and 3 and 4. Um, no, 3 to 5, sorry. And the, what these verses really tell us is, well, when God made the heavens and the earth, he made them to, um, to show his splendour, to show his majesty. Um, and the fact that he, he is concerned about us, a, a mere animal in some ways, is amazing. Um, but there, therefore, if, if he has displayed his splendour above the heavens, in the stars and the things we can see in the sky, then surely when we look there, it must be amazing. Um, and indeed, when we do look, there are some amazing things, and we'll see that in a second. Um, but one other thing is, if we if we accept the what I said before about how the universe is changing, then you have to ask the question: when the universe and the galaxy is pulling each other apart, you have to ask: okay, it, surely if we waited for a long enough time, all the galaxies would be too far for us to see them, and that's the case, and we'll, we'll see that now. So um, here, here is a periodic table of elements. Um, you might have had this in your chemistry classroom. Um, this is a cool one because it tells you where, according to it's called stellar nuclear synthesis, uh, that's the fancy word, where all the elements come from, up to uranium at the bottom, that U92. Um, and the first, um, the first, um, you come from um, the very start of the universe when you had protons and neutrons whizzing around. Um, the next ones, so the green ones, they came from exploding stars, and the and the rest of the heavier ones came from exploding rare stars. I guess is the best way to put put it, um, like the really really big ones. So anyway, what all this needs is it needs time for a star to actually have gone through its whole life cycle. The sun has been around for about 4 billion years, if you accept the science, and um, it will stay for another about 4 billion years, um, apart from when Jesus comes back and that will, that will change all that um, because there'll be a new creation. But um, if you, well, to, in order to have all the elements that make up the planet Earth, you you already needed a lot of time to um, to create all these elements. And if you're going to be a, I've already talked about some of this. Um, if you're going to be an atheist who is going to say everything has to happen by random chance, um, the chances to have that happen in, you might think 14 billion years is a long, is a long time, but it's not long enough for this to happen by chance. So in reality, the longer you wait, the higher the probability is of life starting, if it can start by chance, which I would doubt. Um, you'd need a creator anyway. But again, we're going to grant to the atheist that you can have it start by chance. And the more chance, the better. But then, yeah, what I was saying before, we've already seen the universe expanding. And if you wait for long enough, so to the time periods where it might be probable that life would start, um, then it, the universe should be dark now. All the galaxies should have been so moved so far away from us, we'd only be able to see our own galaxy. So the fact that we can see the universe, are you following me here? The fact that you can see the universe and that life exists is very unlikely if you believe that there's no God, right? It's, however, it's incredibly likely if you believe that there is a God who has declared his glory in the heavens. So, um, here, here's the picture I want to show you. So this is called the Hubble Deep Field picture. And what they did is they took the Hubble telescope, pointed it at, at a dark patch of sky, 
and left it there. And what they found is lots of little, little pinpricks of light. All of those pinpricks of light are themselves galaxies. Um, and so if, well, that, that picture is about the size of the sky if you place a tennis ball 100 metres away and the, that size and project that into the sky, um, which is a very, very, very small amount of the sky. Just think about how many tennis balls you could surround yourself with at 100 metres away. Um, I hope this is blowing your mind because it blows my mind um, that in, within that tiny patch of sky, you've got all these amazing galaxies and for God to, well, God has shown his glory in this, I think, because that, that to me is, shows a creator who is infinitely powerful, infinitely wise, who can, um, who has designed a universe so that we can see this and see his glory, see that light shining. Um, yeah, whereas if there was no God, um, firstly, why is there anything? That was the previous point. But secondly, um, why should we have been allowed to see this? This is it's a, a privilege to me, I think, to be able to see this and know that there's someone who's created me and has a purpose for the world. Okay, so enough of, of that point. Now on to point number three, the fine tuning of the universe. So this is this is the last science you want. So I hope you bear with me on this. Um, but also I think this is also fascinating. So in, so we the best theories we have have four fundamental interactions. So you've got gravity, um, so the thing that makes things fall. Electron, um, you've got in the middle of the weak and the strong, you've got the electromagnetism, so electricity and magnetism, and just combined into one word to sound fancier. And then you've got two others. So there's the weak force, which is what's responsible for nuclear decay, and the strong force, which holds nuclei together. And this strong force, which is the strongest of the forces, hence the name, um, is what we're going to think about now. So the idea is that, well, in, a, in the nucleus of an atom, you've got protons and neutrons. And a proton is positively charged, a neutron is neutral. So if you've got lots of positively charged things together, they're going to just push apart. So the whole point of the strong force is to keep them all bound together in the middle. Um, I, I mean, you can read the bullet points, but if that strong force is three times weaker, um, anything from carbon and heavier would be unstable and we're mostly carbon based creatures so we wouldn't be alive there'd be no life if there was no carbon um, if it was only 30 percent weaker instead of three times weaker um, we'd still like you could still form carbon but other elements such as nitrogen would there just wouldn't be enough of it so 70 percent of our atmosphere is nitrogen 80 percent actually and without, if we had less nitrogen, we wouldn't be able to breathe properly. So you've got things like that that would just be thrown out of balance if, if the strength of this strong force was just a bit weaker. And if it was a bit stronger, so 50% stronger, um, the stars would run out of fuel way too quickly to, it's like the sun would, wouldn't give off any light anymore. It just wouldn't be, the universe wouldn't be good for life. Um, so, so far to run through the three facts. We, um, while the universe has a beginning, which points to creator, um, we can view the universe to see God's glory, which is again, improbable if there was no God. And also the fine tuning of this strong force, it just seems a bit unlikely. We've got no reason why it should be this strength, but we know it is this strength. So if we, if we expect, well, if, if we believe there's a God, it makes sense that it's true for life. And if we believe there is no God, well, why is it like this? Just a coincidence, I guess. Um, but if you believe there's a God, it's a lot more probable. The fourth fact, so the reliability of our brains. This, um, we're gonna talk about the evolutionary argument against naturalism, sounds fancy, it's, it makes sense. Um, and then there's also another argument called the unreasonable effectiveness of maths. So the fact that we can use maths and it works. We're going to start with the evolutionary argument against naturalism. And we, so this was by a guy, it's quite a recent argument. It was um, come up with by Alvin Plantinger in 1993. So we're going to start off by, again, assuming complete naturalism. So we're going to assume um, there's no God. We're going to assume every, that everything happens by random chance. Um, 
if you're a naturalist, you have to believe that, well, life evolved and it evolved mm -hmm. to survive. And that's the only, the only reason life is around. Um, but if you, ex if you expect um, life to have survived, well, why do we do things that don't pr produce survival benefits? And why do our brains work for that? It's like, why do we play music and why do we enjoy it? Um, why can I think something, write it down and then hand it over to someone <laughs> who can also read that and understand it. Why do our brains work? Well, if it's for something that isn't survival, it shouldn't work according to evolution because our brains haven't been adapted to, um, to be able to do those things. So it's only for hunting animals and picking the right berries off plants that we should be able to do reliably. However, it does work. Like, why do our brains work? Well. If, if you're a naturalist, coincidence, I guess, but if you're a, if you're a theist, well, it makes perfect sense because God created our brains. God created us to do all these amazing things. Um, it's like, there's a computer here. This is, I know there are rounds everywhere, but they're, they're really complicated. I don't really know how they work, um, but it makes no sense why we'd be able to make one of these unless our brains functioned reliably and consistently. Um, like they do, and that's because we have a creator. Well, it's much more likely if we have a creator than if we don't. Um, the other argument is the unreasonable effect of maths. Um, so there, there's a common question. Do, do we invent or did we discover maths? Well, there's a bit of philosophy in there, but we'll just take both options. Let's say we invented it. Well, why then are the laws of nature written in maths? You can find a, a physics textbook and you'll see the equations. And why, why do they follow these equations? Like, why are they not words or something like that? Why are they these symbols? Um, well, it's, it's very unlikely that something that we invented would describe the universe so well. Um, so it's probable that this wasn't invented but we discovered it from somewhere. But then if we discovered it, it well, explains why nature's written in this language because it's, I guess, inherent to nature. But then why then, if, there's a, if there are laws and a language in which the laws are written, isn't surely there's someone who's written those laws in that language? Um, so I, in either case, um, it makes a lot more sense that God would, well, that God exists because well, either it's a complete coincidence that has very little chance of happening, or God exists. I hope you're getting, getting the gist of this. Um, whatever is the case, in all these things, it's much more likely that God exists. Um, so the final point, yeah, it's the final one. Um, the miracle of the Jewish people. Um, we'll see a very brief history, then we'll see that they are God's witnesses. And I think this is really the... Um, or is the killer blow to the atheist that why uh, that the Jews are still a people who have a distinct identity? I mean, I, I grabbed this off the back. Uh, so you've got this. Oh, this probably has all the information that I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about a lot. Um, but Israel, God's living proof. Um, yeah, they're why they're Jews still. So a very brief history. So in AD 70 and again, AD 132, you had the Romans who would aggressively put down these Jewish revolts. And I remember reading in AD 132, about half a million Jews were killed. That's a lot. Um, and after that, they were, well, as you know, they were spread out through Europe. They, they also went east, they went, some went to Africa. Um, they were spread out across the whole known world. Um, and for about a period of about 1800 years, they were effectively in exile. They formed their own communities in different um, parts of the, of the world. Um, some eventually went to America, um, but they, they always kept their distinct identity. Um, they never became assimilated, which is in contrast to most of the other nations who have ever existed. Because you, well, you don't get any um, Visigoths now or whatever, or um, I don't know, Hittites, um, because they they have been assimilated into other cultures who the, the empires that beat them and then the empires that beat those empires assimilated the other ones. But the Jews, they even though they were beaten eventually by the Romans, they never lost their identity. 
um, they were persecuted for those 1800 years for not losing their identity, um, for not assimilating. And I mean, as, as we know, the horrific events of the Holocaust um, in Germany, that was the, the pinnacle of their persecution. And three years later, um, the State of Israel was formed by the powers that were. Um, but it, it's amazing that, well, for these 1800 or so years, this people group, they, they never lost their identity and they, they now have a home again. Um, yeah, and another, I haven't written this down, but Hebrew is, I believe it's the only language that has gone extinct and come back as a non-extinct language. So a language to be extinct just means no native speakers. But now you've got people who have been speaking Hebrew for generations. Um, and not only is it the only language to come back from extinction, but it's the only language, well, it, it was over a period of roughly 2000 years, which is also mind, mind blowing that, that that was the case. And um, what does the Bible say about this? Well, Isaiah 44, um, you've got this passage. This is what the Lord says, he who is the king of Israel and his redeemer, the Lord of armies. I am the first and the last, and there is no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it, and let him confront me, beginning with my establishment of the ancient nation. Then let them, is this correct? Yeah, yeah. Then let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? And you, Israel, are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me, or is there any other rock? I know of none. So God said in Isaiah, um, two and a half-ish, give or take a few hundred years, thousand, no, yeah, two and a half-ish, thousand years ago. Um, he said that Israel, you are my witnesses. And because of you, you can look at you can see the Jews and know that I exist. It would be mind-bogglingly small chances if this was written by some guy, like some scribe in in Israel, just off the cuff, and then it's kind of got incorporated into what happened to become the most important book in the world about the people who just happened to survive for 1,800 years without a homeland, and then just happened to get their nation back. Like it's just. It's not going to happen, but it makes so much more sense if God exists and if he has a plan with these people. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, as I said, that, that's kind of the, the killer point that the, that the Jews still exist. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing, honestly. So the five facts again, just to, just to summarize. So things change and they point to a beginning. That's fact number one. We're at the perfect time to view the universe. That's fact number two. Our brains are reliable. We aren't merely creatures of, no, I didn't change this slide. The, I got rid of the fourth fact and put in, ignore the fourth fact. The universe is fine tuned, there you go. And the miracle of the Jews. So we've got these five things that, um, that they, are, they are all just facts. And they're all facts that would make, would be very improbable if there was no God. So the answer to well, Richard Dawkins' question, well, statement, there is probably no God. Well, we can ask a counter question. Is God really improbable? I'd say no. God is actually quite probable. And hopefully, hopefully you might have learned some things about, about physics. Um, hopefully you've been reminded about um, the Jews and because very easy to just think, but to see the news and what's happening there and um, not be a fan. But the fact that these these are God's people and God does have a plan with them, um, yeah, that's always good to think about, I think. Um, yeah, so is God really improbable? Um, no, I'd say he's quite probable. Thank you.